Sometimes creators blow my mind, and Trevor is one of those people. An author, artist, and founder of Up Studios, Trevor is an inspiration for individuals pursuing careers through their creativity. Uh, so I'm Trevor Lai. I'm the founder and CEO of Up Studios. We're a animation studio based in China, but we produce content for all around the world. And I myself am a children's book author, illustrator, and now animation director and producer. So many different uh, outlets that you're getting your creative freedoms out. You know, how did you get involved in all these different aspects from artist, author, and animator? I started drawing when I was four years old. And I think like most kids, I just love drawing. And so when I was creating my own stories and comic books, I actually wanted to be a comic book artist originally. So, you know, I loved X-Men, Batman, Spider-Man, you know, all the usual uh, characters. And then something dawned on me when I was um, 17 years old. I suddenly realized that children's books were kind of like a, a comic book that you read in all different stages of your life. Because when you're very young, your parents read the book to you. And then when you are old enough to read yourself, you'll proudly pick up the book and read it, you know, a thousand times. Uh, and then when you maybe like graduate high school or go to university, sometimes you'll go buy one of your favorite children's books for nostalgic reasons. And then if you have kids or, you know, your friends have kids, then you'll buy that same book that you loved for their kids. And then if you become a, a grandparent, you'll buy that for your grandchildren. So it's kind of like this story that really gets read over and over and over again. And I kind of felt like, well, that would be really cool. You know, if I could create a story or characters that could live on for literally generations, that would be really special. And so that's kind of how I did a pivot from comic books into children's books. And then I started, you know, writing and illustrating my own kids books. And I guess because, you know, I'm, uh, you know, Asian and I'm, I'm you know, I was young uh, for, for an author, you know, to be 17. And so, you know, I started being featured in the media and I got to do my first book tour when I was very young as well. And so, you know, things kind of snowballed. So I went to school at Simon Fraser University. And while I was doing classes there, all of my free time was basically filled up either working or doing book tours. And, you know, I got to cut my teeth at a very young age in the industry. So I got, you know, my first taste of an option to do a TV series based on my character. And I remember getting a check and, uh, you know, saying, wow, this is a lot of money. And then I spent all of it on a lawyer, you know, <laughs> to, to do the contract for it. And I was like, oh, wait, that's not that much money, you know, but I got a great, I feel like I got a law degree, you know, based on that experience. And it was really exciting to also, at a young age, I think, go through, um, you know, the ups and downs where you're doing really well, you're, you're covered on television and all the newspapers and all that kind of stuff. But then at the end of the day, your work needs to speak for itself. And you can't always be promoting your work. And I was still a university student. And so learning those lessons, I think, at a very young age, really set me up for success later on. And so, you know, fast forward to when I founded Up Studios, this year we're actually celebrating our 10th anniversary, uh, which is great. Thank you. So it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, I haven't even had a chance to, you know, slow down and really celebrate our 10 years yet, but it's kind of remarkable. All these lessons I learned when I was in high school and university, they are still relevant today. So I think, you know, going back to all the different titles I wear, you know, uh, you know, in my daily life, I think it's probably because I've always just felt like everything I do is related. So whether I'm a creator um, or a founder, or if when I manage our artists um, that work on our show, for example, Super Boomy, I can kind of uh, understand where everyone's coming from because I've either been there or I've worked with people who've been there. And, uh, you know, I think that helps a lot. So that sort of empathy and understanding of all the different roles, um, I think has been super, super helpful. How did you transition from writing children's books and being an author to um, getting and founding an animation studio? I, I took the longest route possible. No, I did. <laughs> In the middle, you know, what happened is I was doing my children's books for a number of years and it was doing quite well. Um, but I give my parents a lot of credit because they saw me when I was doing my children's books, they saw me being very successful as an individual. And they asked me one day, you know, well, what is your goal? 
And I said, well, my goal is I'd like to create a company like Disney one day. I mean, everyone says that when they're you know, 17, 18, 19, right? And, uh, and they said, well, that's all nice. Um, but you know, your, your company currently, so I had a small company I'd created, you know, has like three people and, you know, Disney has tens of thousands of people. You should go work for a company that has a lot of people. So you know what it's like to be in a big organization. And I thought about it and I thought, oh, that kind of makes sense. So I actually went into advertising for about eight years. I did advertising and marketing and branding strategy in Vancouver. And during those years, Every time I had free time or holidays, I would continue to work on my children's books because my dream was always, I'm setting this up so that one day I can open my own Disney-esque company. Um, but, you know, I was an executive. Eventually I got promoted to be an executive. Then I became vice president uh, of the company. And so, you know, all those lessons were kind of like building blocks towards Up Studios. So, you know, I was kind of joking when I said the longest route possible, but on the other hand, I really feel like it was the perfect setup to founding an animation studio. Uh, because I would say that of all the due diligence I did of other companies, oftentimes uh, small studios can run into trouble uh, when they are, for example, not sure of whether they're an IP company or a production company. And I think, you know, I was very lucky because from day one, I knew I wanted to be an original IP company that happened to have an animation studio. Whereas a lot of companies usually go the other way around. They'll find it in animation studio, do production work, and then later on they'll start to develop their own IP and things like that. And that, that you know, sometimes that works out, but also sometimes that can create its own challenges. A really fun collab that you did this year was with the Vancouver Canucks. How, how did that connection uh, happen? To create that jersey. I've been based in China now for over 10 years and hockey is you know has gone from a very small sport to you know growing over the last few years with the Winter Olympics you know that just finished now people once they heard about it it really ramped up you know whether they were building ice rinks or you know creating teams here and so I started playing ice hockey in Shanghai and when I was there I realized oh this is really burgeoning, vibrant community of hockey lovers here. And maybe we can help grow that between then. That was about 2017, I wanna say, uh, to 2022. And then the Canucks happened to be in Shanghai playing a game, their first ever China games. So obviously being, I would like to say I'm the biggest Canucks fan in China. Uh, <laughs> I bought tickets, I was in row one uh, for that game. Yeah, it was awesome. And, uh, and I actually caught a puck. So I got a puck off an Alex Edler shot, which is amazing. Um, and, you know, basically from that first game, I got to meet some of the people around the team. And I basically told them, hey, listen, I've got my show, Super Boomy, which at the time was a brand new show. So in 2017, I had just launched the show, but I was very confident it would be successful. And I said to them, well, if there's anything I can do to help promote the Canucks or promote hockey, let me know. And I'd love to work with you. And that was sort of the very beginning seed. So that's 2017. And between 2017 and 2018, uh, people from the league, you know, also met me and heard about me. And I was lucky enough to have my character, Boomy, invited to one of their China games, the 2018 China games. So Boomy was there. He was in Shenzhen and Beijing, you know, in the mascot suit. And I was there <laughs> with him. And we produced some little short cartoons you know, to go with the whole uh, experience. And it went over really, really well. So then afterwards, you know, I talked to them about what we could do more. And we came up with the idea of creating the first ever CG animated series for, to teach kids about ice hockey, first in China. But I filmed the series with Boomy. Uh, it's called Super Boomy Hockey Hero to teach kids all around the world. And so they saw the series, I wrote, illustrated, directed the series, we produced it at Up Studios, we created 10 episodes, and it's all about how Boomi learns how to become a hockey player, and then actually like learns from Connor McDavid, uh, you know, Sidney Crosby, yeah, and all these players that I looked up to, and, you know, basically to teach kids here to, to fall in love with the sport. And then we were super lucky that in 2019 and 2020, we actually got to fly out to the All-Star Games 
Uh, so in San Jose and St. Louis, respectively. And each time we went out there, all these NHL fans who had never met Boomy before literally fell in love with the character as soon as they met him. And then they found out there's a cartoon and they went, you know, went online and watched the cartoon. And within China, we have now over 60 million views for Super Boomy Hockey Hero, the Chinese version. So that is by far the most popular ice hockey content uh, here ever produced in China. Now, all of that is to say, in that process, the Canucks obviously and I had maintained contact and we had continued to talk to each other. And we had worked on some small videos and little promotions over the years. And then finally, last summer, you know, one of the things that happened obviously in the last couple of years is during the pandemic, there was a huge rise in anti-Asian activities. Now, as someone who grew up in Vancouver, this really, you know, struck an emotional chord with me. Because, you know, as, as much as, you know, we all go through bullying and we, we all go experience that in our lifetimes, I always felt like Vancouver and British Columbia was a, a wonderful place. And I felt like this rise in activity was something that was not what was in our soul and in our spirit. And we really need to do something about it. And so the Canucks asked me, you know, what can we do that's more meaningful? You know, because every year they would do uh, the Chinese New Year game. Um, but, you know, what could they do that was an extra step? So I had a really heartfelt conversation with them. And we came up with the idea of creating a whole campaign around the jersey for, for, for this year, the year of the Tiger. And I wanted to use the jersey as a springboard to the message of change. So that's why, you know, first and foremost, the thing you'll notice on the jersey is the orca has been transformed into a tiger. And I think that's one of the things that really grabbed a lot of the fan base's attention is that I managed to keep the entire integrity of the Canucks logo, but transform the animal to something completely different. And it symbolizes the tiger leaping out of water, charging forward and leading meaningful, significant change to try to say, let's turn the tide against the last couple of years of these anti-Asian activities and really lead positive change moving forward. And how do we do that? I felt like it was about bringing everyone together. First and foremost, anyone who's ever visited British Columbia and Vancouver has either heard of or stepped foot in Chinatown or has enjoyed Chinatown. And if you've ever been to a Canucks game, chances are you've gone through Chinatown or maybe you've stopped there before or after. And so Chinatown and the Chinese community has always been an integral part of British Columbia. And it's been an integral part of the Vancouver Canucks community. And so I thought that by bringing all of these elements together into the jersey, we could get people to rally around it. And then once they fell in love with the jersey, they would dive deeper into the story behind it. And so, for example, I took the Chinatown, the Millennium Gateway, and I put it on the shoulder patches. And I actually took the Canucks Chinese name, Jia Zhen Dui, and I put it inside of the gateway. Now, that's a detail that if you first look at the jersey, you're going to notice the gateway. And you'll be like, oh, that looks familiar. And then you'll probably say, oh, yeah, that was in Chinatown. And then you'll be like, well, what are those three characters inside the gate? And it's kind of like peeling back the layers, you know, layer by layer. And the more you peel back, the more exciting it is, the more interesting it is. And then you find out that the four characters I put at the top of the gateway are printed on the actual physical sign. And it says, remember the past but look forward to the future. And I just felt like all of these things, you know, it's kind of like when those, uh, the angels are singing and like, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> like, all these things just kind of align perfectly. And so I remember the first time I ever presented over Zoom to the Canucks, my Jersey concept with the tiger and the shoulder patches and things like that. And I think everyone was really impressed and really excited by all the layers of meaning and all the sort of thoughtfulness I had put into this design. And that's why I think you, I'm sure in your research, found tons of articles and, and countless sort of write-ups that went way beyond your typical, oh, that's a really cool jersey, um, you know. And, and I, fe I feel like that's what I'm most proud of is the fact that it made such an impact on the community, the Chinese community, but also the non-Chinese community, which is the entire point of the exercise is to bring both of them together. And to the point where Premier John Horgan, you know, organized the special online round table, he invited myself, uh, the president of Canuck Sports and Entertainment, Jim Rutherford, you know, and 
all these important members of the Chinese community all together to discuss it. And I feel like that was the moment where I felt like, wow, I'm really, really, really proud of, you know, what I've done on a, on a sort of community level uh, beyond just being an individual designer. Yeah, it's the bridging of communities that goes far beyond building relationships, moving towards the future. In your bios, uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, you have the privilege to inspire young readers from Canada to China. You've had this experience. Uh, you know, what is just your thought process and feelings when you're connecting with readers of different cultures on basically opposite sides of the globe? One of the things I feel really lucky about is when I was a teenager touring in British Columbia, I got to tour everywhere from Burnaby to Richmond to Squamish. And I realized one thing, it doesn't matter where the kids were from. You know, whatever their background was socially or economically, they all want to laugh. They all love dinosaurs. I found out a very <laughs> yep. And because I'm a, you know, I was a pretty good artist. Anytime, uh, I remember going to a high school once and it was, uh, I think it was in Mission. And I remember that it was a tough crowd, you know, high school crowd, it's tough. And uh, I remember as soon as I started drawing a Tyrannosaurus Rex, everyone in the room went silent all these teenagers that were kind of like, who's this guy? Who's this guy? And all of a sudden I was drawing the T-Rex and it was like, whoa, that's really cool. You know? <laughs> and I got everyone on my side, right? And I realized that there are so many universal things that can draw people together. Art is really powerful. Stories are really powerful. And I just realized, I think at an early age that I had the ability to create these types of, types of things, to draw people together and break down all the barriers that you can imagine, whether it's language barriers or, uh, you know, ethnic barriers and, and things like that. So I think realizing that allows me to literally, I've toured around the world. I've spoken to audiences, you know, obviously in English, Mandarin, Cantonese. And at the end of the day, they all respond to the same things. You know, they, they respond to the moments of inspiration where I tell them about my journey and how I've been able to create up studios and boomy and Piggy, all these characters they now know and love by watching on TV, but they realized that I started, you know, I never went to art school. You know, I started from probably the same background as them in the sense that drawing on sketchbooks or notepads or on your living room wall, that's literally how I started. And I'm able to tell them step by step by step, you know, what I was able to, you know, do to build the today, the characters that you see. So I think, you know, to answer your question, whenever I travel around the world, I try to keep it very simple and focus on the universal things that I think will appeal to every audience. And then from that platform, then I can tailor messages to whether I'm speaking to adults. Sometimes I'm talking to business people. You know, I've, I've spoken at conferences with hundreds of very successful executives and business people. And then I talk about things that are universal to them. You know, I can, I can tell you a message, but kids are the best because kids will laugh at your jokes and, you know, and they'll respond to any sort of cool drawing that you do. And, and I feel like that's probably what is the most common that I found around the world. When you're meeting with these kids, going to high schools and having these uh, conversations, what is one piece of advice that you give them if they're creative and wanting to pursue a career in creativity and specifically for individuals of diverse backgrounds who are wanting to share their cultures through various mediums? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I'm trying to think, single out one piece of advice. You know, I usually give a lot, uh, but if I was to single out one that I, I often reach, refer to, especially when it comes to uh, people of different ethnic backgrounds, is I try to tell them, Focus on one thing that can make you unique. So I think that part of using your culture and your voice and your experiences is something that can make your story unique. So rather than trying to retell a story that you've seen um, told by someone else already, and maybe it's a mainstream comic book character that you've already seen a thousand times, why not create a character that's closer to your background? You know, and I think it's been really cool over the last couple of years, we've started to see the Shang-Chi's of the world, which was probably not possible 15 years ago, right? And I think that's really, and, and also just recently, um, Turning Red, the, the new Pixar film that came out. That's another story, again, uh, the director's from Toronto, I believe. 
And so that was a story really specific to her, her upbringing, uh, you know, as an Asian in, in Toronto growing up. And so I think you look at the successful creators, they found that voice and they found that unique story. And then I think what makes them truly successful is adding those universal elements I just talked about that I have found, you know, that are common across all audiences. I think as a filmmaker, when you want to create a film or as an author, you want to create a book that will appeal to as many people as possible, you do have to find those universal touch points. But the starting point, I think, has to come from your heart, your experience, and your unique voice. So that is something I constantly tell audiences is rather than asking what's popular out there, because a lot of times kids or young people will say, well, you know, should I study what's popular or, you know, should I check what's trending? And I more often than not just say no. I said don't, because first of all, by the time you see it, it's been in development for sometimes three years, five years, sometimes it's been de developed even longer. So by the time you've seen it and it's popular and then you start to copy it or try to do something similar to it, by the time you get it out there, people will be on to the next thing. So I always try to encourage them to start from themselves because then you'll never be out of date. You won't be chasing a trend because you're always going to be relevant and your story is always going to be true. So I think starting from there gives you a center of gravity that is very powerful and allows you to pivot and to move you know, with, with meaning from that center of gravity. I feel this decade is going to be a cultural resurgence in terms of media, we're seeing a lot of different content, talking about a lot of stories about different people. And I think executives will see that people are connecting and relating to this material. And we'll hopefully see more of it in the future and have a wide array of interesting cultural stories. My dream, you know, as well as to be a part of that movement. And I think projects like the Lunar New Year Jersey with the Vancouver Canucks that's also an example of that. That's a story that made its way into the mainstream media and in a huge, you know, sport and a team that was beloved in the mainstream. But I had a unique voice and a unique message that happened to sort of dovetail really well together. Where can people go to find out more about Up Studios as well as your uh, children's books? The first place they can go is probably Instagram. They can go look at Up Studios World. And we have our own YouTube channel. So if they just look up Up Studios World, or if they type in Super Boomy, B-O-O-M-I, they'll be able to find all of our content there as well. If you have any stories you'd like us to share or communities we should highlight, leave a comment on our social media or reach out to us on our website. I'm Ryan Funk. This was You Talk. And have yourself a good one.